Basketball is back. Live action was Friday night, the first public viewing of the 23-24 Tar Heels. What did we learn about Hubert Davis's third team? You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listener watch to get your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Folks, would love for you to have a conversation with us. We're going to talk about live action today. Maybe you want to have that conversation with more Tar Heels. Come join our Discord, a great and growing community of the Locked on Tar Heels family. The link is in the show notes on YouTube and in the audio format as well. I uh, want to also remind you, Carolina, once again, the football team racking up ACC Player of the Week awards. They've had at least one every week. And for Friday, or for Saturday's win over Miami, a season high four ACC player of the week awards. It was Drake May, it was Cedric Gray, it was Omarion Hampton, and of course, Tez Walker. Great stuff from the football Tar Heels. All right, coming up on the show today, we are going to talk about live action. Also want to look at the AP preseason poll was released on Monday. Don't worry, the Tar Heels weren't ranked first this year, so there's no fall from grace that is potential to come. But uh, we want to get straight into talking about live action. So uh, a couple things up front as I get into my takeaways from the events of Friday night. Just out of the gate, how could you not how could you watch this and not be encouraged and not be just over the moon excited for a new year of basketball, an opportunity to put what happened last year behind us all? I mean, folks, this time, Tuesday, as you're watching this, three weeks from now, we will be recapping the first regular season game. Come on. That's awesome. I know you're pumped. I'm pumped. Let's make it happen. Now, before we actually talk about the game, let me just give you a reminder. I said off the out of the gate, what are the things we learned about Hubert Davis's third team? But let me also say in the same breath, the reminder to take what you saw Friday night in the Smith Center with a little bit of a grain of salt. I, I want to encourage you to not make broad sweeping assumptions about the team or about any individual players based on someone playing better or worse than you expected them to, based on somebody having a little bit of a different role than you imagined. It, it is not the moment for that. There are things we can learn, but it's not about changing your opinion of a player based on this glorified exhibition NBA all-star game type moment. Although at the same time, I will say this, because we're further into practice than typically would be for live action, this was higher level basketball. It was more competitive than we typically see, and I am here for that. Big fan of it, so glad that was able to happen. Um, but yeah, there are going to be some intangibles we can take away from this, things that we want to learn about the new guys, maybe some new things that we saw from either our RJ or Armando or Jalen Washington or Seth Trimble returning. Um, of course, um, Seth, un unable to play, still seems like he has that lower body injury that he's nursing and, and just getting ready to be back to big health. So Again, there's going to be things we can take away, but in general, let me encourage you and me, a reminder to myself, to be tempered in your response to what happened Friday night. But that does not mean we can't talk about it, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's talk about it. The game itself, just the setup of it, in case you didn't get a chance to see it, it was two 12-minute halves with a five-minute halftime. Again, Seth Trimble didn't play, but everyone else did. Here was the roster breakup there's 13 other guys 11 scholarship players and or 10 not including seth and then the three walk-ons the blue team was made up of elliot cadeau paxton wojic jalen withers armando baycott james aconquo and creighton lebo the white team was made up of rj davis cormac ryan harrison ingram jalen washington zayden high dewey ferris and pierce 
or <laughs> Pierce Landry, Rob Landry, excuse me. I'm trying to call him by his dad's name. So I, what I've got for you are four observations that I want to take away from this. And then I'll have some other observations as we get into the next segment. So number one, right out of the gate, fast breaks, things are moving more quickly. Let me highlight two specific moments that I thought highlighted what I'm hopeful is going to be the pace of the Tar Heels, or at least the pace they're able to get back to this year. Coach Davis has talked about getting back to pace. He's he's pushing it. And so here's what I love. In, in one from each half of this game. First moment, uh, Elliot Cadeau got a switch and tried to take Dewey Ferris. He missed, fell on the baseline, and it kind of took him out of the play. Dewey gets the rebound, outlets to R.J. Davis, who pitches ahead to Harrison Ingram on the left wing, who then found immediately Cormac Ryan in the left corner. Boom, boom, boom. There were two dribbles in that entire sequence. Dewey passes it to R.J. R.J. dribbles twice, finds Ingram immediately to Cormac Ryan. The ball doesn't stick. The ball moves, and Cormac Ryan buries it. He had trouble shooting some of the rest of the night, but again, we're not taking away too much from this. So buckets, beautiful, crisp, quick passing, no hesitation on the passes or the Cormac Ryan three, um, getting out and running, pitching ahead. The ball's not sticking. I, I looked at, I timed it from the moment of the rebound till the moment Cormac Ryan's ball went through the basket, six seconds, six seconds. That is Tar Heel basketball. I'm here for that. My second favorite moment of a similar ilk came in the second half. There's about three minutes left. Um, Paxson Wojcik from the left wing tried an entry pass to Armando Baycott. He couldn't couldn't quite corral it. Cormac Ryan pulls it away from him, starts the break, and uh, leads it the whole way, draws the defender. Um, ah, forgive me, I can't remember who it was, but is able to hit Jalen Washington in stride for a dunk. Another very quick hitter, shot, um, two points for Carolina. But then right after that, Elliot Cadeau, coast to coast the other way layup and then rj finds a cutting jalen washington again so boom 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 three buckets in a row fast 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 this is what i want to see from the tar heels now part of that last segment uh last sequence i guess i should say was guys wearing down near the end of a uh, timeout was called immediately after that but um this is encouraging the second of the four takeaways that i want to say is that armando baycott is moving folks and here's what I mean. We we generally know what we're going to get from the returners, especially those who have been in the starting lineup or been around for a long time. So more so RJ and Armando than would be Jalen Washington and Seth Trimble, just because we've only got a year with them and limited minutes for both. But Armando and RJ, you feel like you know what you're getting. That's part of what gives me some, some level of comfort with this year's team. Um, now, I guess with RJ, we don't completely know everything we're going to get from him because we haven't seen him without Caleb Love, right? This is a whole different look for him in the backcourt now. Um, but there, there were some things that I liked from Armando that maybe hadn't seen last year. Again, I, I kind of joke that he's moving, and I, I literally mean that. Number one, it looks like he's just um, his lower body is more fully healed than it was last year. Just felt like he was still experiencing lingering effects last year and this year will be more fully recovered from uh, that national championship game run the previous season and then secondly he just appears to be in what i think is the best shape i've seen him be in in his five seasons at carolina now just seem to be moving more effortlessly and uh i think that's going to pay dividends for him and so you saw it early in the game back to back to back possessions three straight buckets for his team in three different ways. I loved it. The first was an entry pass, uh, just made a couple moves and a nice just little turnaround right there in the lane. The sec the next possession had an offensive rebound and layup. And then the third possession was a long baseline two just inside the three-point line. And so, and there was no hesitation. Like he pulled it, it looked great and you love to see it. So with Armando, I mean, I, I really think he projects to have a ton of success in the post this year. None of none of the stretch or none of the fours that will play with him, whether it's Harrison Ingram, whether it is Jalen Withers, whether it's a big jumbo package with Jalen Washington, none of them are manic level shooters, but neither do I see them as, as Pete Nance 
type be more in the paint guys. They project to be more, you know, perimeter oriented or free throw level oriented players, meaning Armando has a lot more room to operate this year. And I think we saw some of that on Friday night. And that excites me a lot to allow his productivity to get back to what it was two seasons ago. Really looking forward to that. Also, Elliot really is going to understand how to get him the ball more regularly and in the right place and in the right time and from the right entry angle and all that kind of stuff that he just hadn't had. So there's there's a lot of optimism on my end about Armando Baycott this year. Do have the two other things I want to share with you, my big two takeaways from this, and they both have to do with freshmen. Going to share those with you in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, who helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's super easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn, and then you just add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skill set and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview and then ultimately hire. Because honestly, getting that right team member is going to have a positive and measurable impact on the way your business operates. This is why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Want to remind you all that coming up on Friday of this week is another edition of Locked On College Football Kickoff Live coming at you from 11 a.m. till noon Eastern on every Locked On College YouTube page, including ours right here on Locked On Tar Heels. Getting you ready for this weekend of college football action is Carolina hosts Virginia. Going to be a, a big time moment to see how Carolina responds to the win over Miami on Saturday. Can they keep it going against a not great team in Virginia? An interesting game. Make sure you tune into Locked On College Football Kickoff Live to get ready for it, 11 a.m. to noon Eastern. All right, the next two things that are my big takeaways from Friday night's live action both have to do with the two-person freshman class. So first off, number three on the things I'm looking at, Zayden High is somebody that I do not you know, have not necessarily expected to see a ton of minutes this year, but that does not mean he won't see minutes, especially if he does what he did on Friday night. He looked confident. He looked athletic. I love seeing him stick his nose in there on rebounding action multiple times on the offensive glass. In fact, he came away with rebounds. And if you're going to do things like that, Zayden, hi, my friend, you are going to force the coaching staff to put you in the game because that's what Hubert Davis wants to see. It's one of his keys for this year is to get back up in offensive rebounding um, prowess among the nation, um, which Carolina hasn't necessarily done the past two seasons. So if Zayden has a knack for getting the ball on the offensive glass, you, my friend, might have just found yourself some more minutes. Um, I I love the one. There's one where he just kind of poked it away from Elliot Cadeau and got a layup. He had some nice cuts. He just was, he just seems to be around the ball as he needs to be. He's very active. Some other things he did. He scored on a roll off some action with um, Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan. Um, he had another bucket, just a little floater um, off an entry pass from RJ Davis. There's another one where RJ and RJ and Jalen Washington were having a little two man pick and roll game. And um, Zayden's hanging out in the left corner. He sees it, cuts gets a dunk off of the roll. It it was beautiful. Um, And there was another time he was trying to follow, I believe it was a Cormac Ryan miss. He couldn't quite get the grip on the ball on the offensive glass. Um, And that was when Elliot wound up with it. He pokes it away from him, takes it and finishes. So perhaps Zayden high could have more than a role, more of a role than I had originally imagined this season. Or perhaps I'm being a prisoner of the moment that I said we got to be careful of with live action where you cannot take away 
too terribly many things. However, given his ability to do some intangibles, these little things that need to get done to help a team win, I'm encouraged by that, as I imagine are you. To quote a source on it, quote, he's just sticking to the script the coaches want him to do, end quote. And I think that's important. If the coaches are asking you to fulfill a specific role, and you can do that as a freshman, show that you're teachable, show that you're coachable, show that you can do what you're asked to do, you're going to find yourself on the court. Switching from Zayden High to Elliot Cadeau. Uh, this was the first chance to really see Elliot Cadeau in action at this level. You know, he comes in with all this hype, all this promise. <clears throat> and it was interesting. I, you know, you, we hear so much about him as a Kendall Marshall mold. But, you, you know, if you listen to the broadcast, you heard them talk about, um, I think it was Coach Lebo, compare him more to Ed Coda than Kendall Marshall. So some interesting things there. But what was interesting to me right out of the gate is it felt like Elliot was calling his own number a good deal more than I think many of us imagined that he would in terms of getting his own shot versus setting other teammates up. And again, remember, this is just live action, so you can't take too much away from that or what it meant. But it also shows that Elliot is willing to get shots up, not, not just be a facilitator. And I, I love that confidence. I mean, literally, the first play of the game, he gets into the lane, pull, pulls up, gets a shot, found himself open, take it. You know, he had all these moments late. It, it, it was just phenomenal. And so, um, of course, the funny thing is, literally right after I typed myself a note about him calling his own number more than I thought he would, um, I typed it, and then... He drives and lays it off for a wide open Armando Bay cut, drew Jalen Washington over to him, and Armando is able to get an easy bucket. Um, and so th there are some of those moments, but there are other moments like a great um, take in the lane, ending with a little scoop shot, swerving around people, getting up and under, great stuff. And then those back-to-back -back threes right at the end of the game. I mean, we had some drama, drama at the end of live action which included Elliot burying back-to-back -back threes to help tie things up with, it was like 13 seconds left or something at that point. You know what that says to me about Elliot Cadeau? Not only is he capable of, of making the passes you need him to make, this dude's not afraid to take the shot at the end of the game. I, I think back to Kobe White's freshman year. I believe it was the ACC semifinal. Carolina had won both of the first two games against Duke. And they were playing them again in the ACC. I'm pretty sure it was the ACC semifinal. And Carolina needed, I, I forget if they were down three or down two, whatever it was, but Kobe White was not afraid to take the last shot. And I see that in Elliot Cadeau, ties the game, great stuff, and I'm encouraged by all of that. Um, and so, yeah, Elliot Cadeau, as advertised, right? And, and we talked about last week, are we looking at competitive balance as to why he and RJ weren't playing on the same team at open practice? Are we looking at, you know, him perhaps not starting? If, if Friday is any indication, he's doing everything he needs to do. And there's no reason we shouldn't expect them to be sharing the backcourt from the get-go. Of course, until we actually see it, we won't know. I think we'll probably learn a little bit about that from the St. Augs exhibition game coming up soon. Well, want to give you some takeaways from the AP poll that came out on Monday, along with the Ken Palm rankings that came out on Sunday. We're going to get to all of that. Where's Carolina sit? How do things look? I'll tell you this. It ain't number one like it was last year, but they are ranked. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by, by Prize Picks which offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts, like Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% off, giving you better value than they already do. With Prize Picks reboot policy, your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. Prize Picks is the only, the only daily fantasy sports platform with injury insurance. I love that. Way to go, Prize Picks. Seriously. And it's so crazy easy to do. You pick two or more players and you just choose more or less than the given stat. For example, Drake May's passing yards for this week is set at 225 and a half. You would be crazy not to take more on that. So go ahead, do it. It just makes sense. 
Price picks. Easy. You can handle it. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Okay. Preseason AP poll and the Ken Palm rankings came out. Uh, Ken Palm on Sunday afternoon and a preseason AP poll on Monday afternoon. Let me just say, given what you see in these two areas and the other computer rankings, it's time for North Carolina. It's time for the ACC to reclaim what they've been, to prove that they are better than the AP voters or that the computers behind Ken Palm and other things have been saying the last couple of years. It drives, it's so frustrating to me. But we'll talk, we'll look at it, see what those numbers are. But ACC has to rise back up. And that's going to start in the non-conference portion of the schedule. It's time to show what the Tar Heels and the rest of the ACC is capable of. So here we go. Let's start with the AP poll. Carolina comes in at 19th. It's a little lower than I expected them to be, but who cares? It's a preseason AP poll, right? You got to go out and prove it. You got to go win games on the court. And if you do that, you're going to move up. Plain and simple. There are only, interestingly, just three teams, ACC teams, that is, ranked in the top 25. Duke is second behind only Kansas and just ahead of Purdue. Miami comes in at 13 and then Carolina at 19. In fact, there's only one other ACC team, even in others receiving votes. That's Virginia coming in at 31st. This is wild. You just don't expect these things from the ACC, but that's where it's at this year. (laughs) As you look at the AP poll in terms of ranked teams on Carolina's schedule, there are seven guaranteed games that the Tar Heels will play against the preseason AP top 25. And there are two more potential games that Carolina will play against the preseason top 25. Let me talk you through those, um, not necessarily chronologically, just as I was looking through things. Obviously, in ACC play, you've got two games against Dukes. That's two of the guarantees. And then you've also got two games against Miami. So, I mean, that's a kind of tough part of the schedule for Carolina is that of the only two other ACC teams that are ranked in the AP Top 25, they play both of them twice. So that's four of your guaranteed seven uh, matchups against uh, preseason AP Top 25 ranked teams. The other three is that killer stretch that Carolina has um, that also has that Florida state game mixed into it. UConn comes in at number six in the preseason, Tennessee, number nine and Kentucky 16 Carolina plays guaranteed all three of those teams. But what's even more crazy is just before the, that UConn, Tennessee, Kentucky stretch Carolina's final two games of the battle for Atlantis are also potentially going to be against teams in the AP preseason top 25 game two, game one's Northern Iowa. They're not ranked, but game two is either Villanova or Texas tech. Villanova is 22nd in the AP preseason poll. And then the third game, multiple teams it could be against one of which is Arkansas who is 14th in the AP preseason poll. <clears throat> so these Tar Heels are going to be tested high and heavy in the non-conference portion of the schedule. In fact, much more so, at least by the in terms of the AP preseason poll, than they will be in ACC play, wildly enough. Now, in terms of Ken Palm, let me give you some Carolina-specific things first and then some ACC-specific things. Carolina comes in a little bit higher in the Ken Palm preseason rankings at 17. I think that's getting close to where closer to where I would have them because it is a prove-it year right? You've got a, a almost brand new roster. You've got two stalwarts back and, and probably I would say the two that you want back, but with a whole roster of guys coming in that, that AP voters are going to have to see it to believe it. Same with the Ken Palm computer. So 17, I'm great with that. Fine with that. Again, it's just the number at the beginning of the season. You got to go out and prove it. Their offense is ranked 15th defense ranked 24th. So you'll take that, but you want to see both of those grow to higher levels. The projected tempo for the Tar Heels on Ken Palm is 59th. Hopefully, they're going to be moving that up higher this year. And here's probably the part that we're all looking at and waiting on is the projected record at Ken Palm right now is 21 and 8 overall, 14 and 6 in ACC play. Now, in terms of the actual um, 
uh, percentage chance of winning. There were only three of those listed games that Ken Palm has Carolina losing, but um, the numbers kind of the way it aggregates and looks at the full season, that's what it's giving. Now you notice that's only 29 games. So that doesn't include, it does include Northern Iowa, but it doesn't include the two games, uh, the second and third game of battle for Atlanta, since the computers don't know who Carolina is playing yet. So that's where it has it. Now, toughest games on Carolina's schedule by Ken Palm ranking. UConn is fourth at Ken Palm. Tennessee is eighth. Duke is ninth. And Kentucky is 18th. Interestingly, Miami is a good bit further down in the Ken Palm preseason rankings. I believe they're in the 30s, if I remember correctly. Well, let me give you some ACC-wide <clears throat> um, stuff from the Ken Palm preseason rankings. If you don't mess with Ken Palm much, uh, it's great content, but I'm, I'm always happy to provide it for you. Uh, one of the things it does is look at ranking every conference based on all the margins and all the algorithms. And it says right now in preseason that the ACC is ranked sixth as a conference behind all the other Power Six conferences being um, SEC, Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12, and Big East is considered one of the power conferences in basketball. Obviously, Pac-12 will soon dissolve, but right now, they're even in front of the ACC. And again, there's, Miami is not top 25 in the Ken Palm rankings. Only Duke and Carolina are. Duke is ranked quite a bit lower, relatively speaking, than they are in the AP poll. They're ninth at Ken Palm. Uh, I think part of the issue for the ACC is that five of the 15 teams, so that's a full one-third of the conference, are outside the top 100. There's, For reference, there's 362 total teams in Division I. And so, you know, you think, well, there's got to be teams outside the top 100. Yeah, but not at the power conference level. I'll compare ACC to the others here in just a second. But Syracuse is 105, Louisville's 109, Georgia Tech 118, Boston College 128, and Notre Dame is the second lowest ranked power six conference school, 165th. Only, only Oregon State is lower. And I think it's not by much. They're like in the 170s. So that's all. It's that, but that lower end of the ACC that's bringing the conference ranking down by comparison. Again, uh, the ACC has five teams outside the top 100. Big 12's lowest team out of their 14, is 72. The SEC's lowest is 82. The Big Ten only has one team outside the top 100. Big East has just two of their 11 outside the top 100, and the Pac-12 has just two outside of their top 100. I already told you Oregon State, and the other, of course, is Cal, who's coming to the ACC. Awesome. Great. But that's why, because the ACC has so many more teams lower ranked than the other power conferences, that's just what it is. So, Again, ACC is going to have to do some work to prove that they are back in that top three, top two conferences. But right now, it doesn't project that they will this year. We'll wait and see how it all plays out. Well, that's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you, Everydayers, for tuning in with us. If you're not an Everydayer, if you're just tuning in for the first time or you're a repeat offender, welcome in. So glad you're here. Keep coming back. Make this part of your daily rhythm. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On CBB. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. Email the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Would love to have more in-depth conversation with you. Maybe you got a question to ask that we could answer on the show. Again, come join the Discord. Come be part of this community where we just have conversations going on all day long. It's so much fun. Again, the link is in the show notes on both audio and video. Why don't you go ahead and subscribe to the show? This thing is growing like crazy. You want to get in on it as the football team's going crazy. It's almost basketball season. Do not miss out. Also, smash the like button if you're watching on YouTube to let us know you were here. And again, we'd love to hear your comments on today's show and your takeaways from live action and other things. Y'all, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be right back with you tomorrow with Coach Pat Kilby. But until then, peace.